Today we've got a great nuclear revenge story where somebody gets fooled into traveling to an entire different country. But first, I stole my dad's money and rendered him penniless. The earliest memory I have of my childhood was of my dad handing my mom across the face. We were at the table eating dinner, and my mom was breastfeeding my baby brother. I remember my dad talking loudly to himself. He was probably complaining about something that my mom had done. My mom was quiet. She said nothing all through his outbursts. She just fed my brother quietly while I watched. My dad suddenly stood and walked out of the dining area, and my mom muttered something to herself, not realizing that my dad could hear her. He walked up to her and asked her to repeat herself. She ignored him, so he yelled at her and shook her shoulders. My brother started to cry. He was frightened, and I burst into tears too. My mom courageously repeated herself, and my dad slapped. I stopped crying and just looked on in shock. My baby brother also stopped crying. I remember my mom got up slowly and started to walk away. My dad ran after her and got on his knees apologizing. That was the first time I ever saw my dad do that to my mom. I found out years later that it wasn't the first time he'd done that to her. He had done so once before they were even married. He didn't do that to her again for a long time, but he was still terrible. We walked on eggshells in the house in fear of him. My mom was a non-entity in the house. She only existed. She hardly ever spoke unless he was out of the house. And even when she did speak, it was in monosyllables. She was never apparent to me. She never corrected me. I did things as a child, hoping she would get mad, be a parent and discipline me, but she never did. It was as though she didn't feel qualified to do that, or she didn't feel like she had any kind of authority over me. My mom started losing it right before our eyes. She stopped going to school. She was a teacher in an elementary school close to our home. I don't know if my dad had issues with that. I can't remember if he did. At some point, it was almost like she couldn't see anyone or comprehend what was going on around her. She stopped cooking and stopped taking care of herself. I remember my mom being very obsessed with her hair. She brushed it so many times and had all of these products on her vanity for her hair. She had beautiful, soft, full hair. So it was the only good thing she had going for her. At least she treated it as such. I remember being so alarmed when I noticed my mom's hair wasn't looking as luscious and beautiful as it used to. One day, my dad returned from work and went upstairs to their room. He ran back down the stairs and came up to me in the kitchen, where I was trying to help myself to a bowl of cereal. It was all I ate then since my mom hardly cooked. Your mother is going nuts, he exclaimed. I remember wondering why he looked so excited about that. He then ran back up the stairs, muttering, she's crazy, to himself. The second time I saw my dad lay his hands was on a Friday evening. The school bus had dropped me right in front of our house and I was hungry. I ran inside looking forward to make myself a bowl of my favorite cereal. I was not prepared for the nice smelling cookies I perceived coming from the kitchen. My mom was in the kitchen in a light pink dress, her hair brushed and moisturized. It was as shiny as it used to be and she was baking and cooking in batches. My mom baked and still bakes the best cookies ever. I was so excited and relieved that I didn't have to eat cereal that evening. She smiled at me, dropped two big cookies on a plate and passed them to me. She then brought out a jug of smoothies from the fridge and poured me a cup. I was so happy. It was the last time I was happy in that house. I went back to my room and went on to have a shower. My dad hosted guests in the house that evening. It was past my bedtime but I stayed up watching the event from the top of the stairs. My mom didn't care. She never cared about things like that. I fell asleep there and woke up to hear my dad yelling furiously. I tiptoed sleepily to the kitchen where the noise was coming from and saw my dad screaming at the top of his voice. He had a loud voice, naturally, but he was extremely loud that day. How dare you embarrass me like that, he kept asking. My mom, as usual, kept quiet. She sat on the kitchen table, her arms crossed on her chest. You're not gonna say anything, huh? I'm going to bed. Good night, I heard my mom say weakly as she made to get up. That offended my dad because he walked up to her and struck hard in the face. It was a heavy punch. I thought my mom would collapse, but she didn't. She didn't even hold her face like she did the last time he did that to her. Before anyone could say anything, my mom made for the kitchen counter to pick something up. My dad, alarmed, took to his heels and she chased him around the house. 
My dad suddenly started screaming. I stood in the kitchen, too shocked and too frightened to move away from the kitchen. Jesus, I heard my dad yell. My mom had used what she picked up against him. I finally moved away from the kitchen and saw my dad holding his arm, which was already covered in blood. He ran up to the telephone and called the police. My mom stopped chasing after him and fled to her room. That midnight, the police came and took my mom away. He was divorcing my mom. My dad told me that a week later. My mom never returned to live with us after she was taken away by the police. Her sister, who had been previously estranged from her, bailed her from her police custody and took her away with her. My mom had no money. Her sister had no money too, so they weren't able to pay for a good divorce lawyer. My dad managed to convince the judge that my mom was mentally unstable and was unfit to get custody of me and my then three-year-old brother. He got full custody and we hardly ever saw our mom again. My dad soon started dating again and in no time he proposed to his girlfriend. They had a little wedding, even my brother and I didn't get to attend, and she moved in with us. She had a daughter, so her daughter came with her too. It was a great development for me because I'd always wanted a sister. While I had a great relationship with my stepsister, I didn't get along well with her mother. She was just like my mother and it irritated me. She was weak, quiet, and always eager to please my dad. My dad didn't use his hands on her until she had lived with us for a full year. He actually did though on the night of their marriage anniversary. They returned that night and her daughter and I were in my room with my little brother. We heard them arguing from downstairs. As usual, my dad's voice was very loud. It drowned out her tiny, meek voice. Then we heard him slap her. We both said nothing to each other. Later that night, my stepsister whispered to me that her dad used to do that to her mom too. My dad had always been abusive towards women and us too. He yelled at us for the tiniest things, and he once pushed me up into the wall when I talked back at him. He also used a ruler on my brother once before. We hated and feared him in the house. I looked forward to growing up and leaving his house someday. I dreamed of finding my mom and having a good relationship with her. My brother and I barely ever saw my mom. The calls she made to us were always supervised by my dad. While my dad had always been abusive, it got worse when he was fired from work. He was fired because he was having an inappropriate relationship with a junior staff member. The company was totally against that sort of relationship, so he was fired immediately. My dad became even worse. He hurt my stepmom more often. Her daughter sometimes tried to step in and he would push her. One day he hit her in the process. She ran upstairs and called the police. She told the police when they arrived that my dad was hitting her mom and that he hit her when she tried to defend her mother. He lied that he didn't do that and to my stepsister's horror, my stepmother denied that my dad ever did that to her or her daughter. She said her daughter was only being a hysterical brat and apologized to the police for wasting their time. One of the officers was not convinced, so she asked my stepsister to give her a call if she didn't feel safe and handed her a piece of paper containing her phone number. A week after, my stepsister ran away from home. I never heard from her until we became adults. She admitted to me that she didn't run away. Her mom made her leave for her great aunt's home. She was convinced that if her daughter left, my dad would treat her better, but he didn't. My dad had trouble getting a new job because he had a bad record from his previous job. He soon got a job at an unregistered money lending company. He was paid in cash because the company didn't want traces of their business out there. Since his retirement wasn't taken care of by the company, my dad told us he'd have to save up as much as he could. He couldn't save so much in the banks to avoid being questioned, so we saved up in cash. For the first few months since he got the job, he was nicer to everyone. But he soon went back to his default setting, being extremely abusive towards everyone. My stepmom never seemed to be bothered by his actions, but I read books on abusive parents and started to see why my dad is dangerous and learn about how his behavior could affect mine too. I wanted my brother to learn, so I passed those books to him too. I was driving my brother and me to school one day when I saw my mother standing just in front of our school. My brother and I were excited to see her. She was a lot different from who I remembered her to be. I thought her mouth got bigger too because she had a big smile on, her voice was louder, and she seemed more real, unlike before when she looked like she was some plastic with no emotions. 
We talked briefly because we had to go to school, but she promised to come back to see us. I didn't trust that because she had promised several times to come back and see us and never showed up, but she did come back. She said, I've been going to therapy. I want us all to go to therapy together. I was glad to hear that from my mom, but I knew my dad would never allow that. He had always hated the idea of his children talking to a therapist. He was worried that we would tell a shrink about his behavior. My mom told us she couldn't afford a lawyer and that she would fight to get custody of my brother. I was already 17 and would soon be free of my dad anyway, so she was more interested in my brother. I promised I would support them in any way that I could. When my dad got alerted that my mom was trying to get custody of my brother, he flared up. The next weeks had him being extremely nice to us. We weren't fooled though, but we didn't let on that we'd been speaking to our mom. The court proceedings started with the judge first giving my mom visitation rights. My mom provided evidence that she was seeking help and is in great health mentally, so she was allowed to visit us and take us out. She was also permitted to have us over for weekends and all other stuff. My dad tried to be nice at first to get us over to his side but I guess the person can only pretend for so long. He soon reverted to his regular ways. My brother and I were invited to speak before the judge, and my dad and mom were removed from the court so they would not influence our answers. My mom finally talked about the years in which she tolerated abuse from him and told the court that she did not want my brother to live in that environment anymore. My mom's lawyer already informed her that the case was not looking so good for my dad and he could lose, so we were ready to move our stuff and go live with our mom. Just as her lawyer predicted, my mom won and I had never been happier. I wanted better for my brother and I was not just tired of having an abusive father, I was tired of watching him do that to my stepmom. As soon as my mom informed us, I snuck into my dad's bedroom and went straight to his safe. I had seen him unlock the code in the past, so I knew the combination. My dad always thought he was so smart. He was super careful about letting us know stuff, but he wasn't so smart. I unlocked his safe and took a lot of money from his safe. It was the money he'd been saving to protect himself when the illegal company he was working for finally collapsed. I took nearly all the money I could find. My brother and I packed up our stuff, and our mom came to get us. My brother and I cut our dad off. He called my mom many times threatening to find and end us. My mom swore to go to the police with the recording from his calls if he ever called again, so he stopped. He called a month later, asking to speak with me and begging me to return his money. It was truly pathetic. The one good thing about that money is because they got it in a more than shady way, there is no way that they can go and get that money back without probably getting the police involved and implicating them in one way or another. They know they themselves can't go hunting down after that money because, in some way, in some form, they're going to land themselves behind bars. Also, hi, I'm Steven, and if you enjoy these crazy stories of nuclear revenge, why not hit that subscribe button down below? That said, our final crazy story of the day is, Stupid Jock humiliated my friend, so I made him travel to another country. There's a known stereotype about athletic jocks. It mostly revolves around the fact that they're not, well, how do I say this? They're not as intelligent as other people. I used to be an advocate for the notion that everybody was equally smart, or at least has the potential to be smart. I stopped believing this when I got to college and met Edward, one of the stars of the college football team. As talented and charismatic as he was, he was clueless at every other thing. You couldn't hold an actual conversation with Edward. Most of the details would go over his head, and you would spend more time explaining than conversing. Seriously, it was as pointless as teaching poetry to a bundle of bullfrogs. Anyways, Edward wronged my best friend Chris, so we decided to get revenge. We decided to push the limits and see how far his stupidity would go, and what we found out was really surprising. His stupidity knew no borders, literally. We made him travel to another country under the pretense that he was going to be signed by a major football team, and as crazy as it sounds, it worked on Edward. Let me tell you how it all happened. I got to college at age 18, and as a shy kid from Minnesota, I didn't relate well with people. I was used to the closely-knit suburban town that I spent the first 18 years of my life in. 
And moving to the big city was a really strange and kind of scary experience for me. I did it anyways, and my first day in the dorm was, well, let's just say, surprising. It was really loud, and the other students were so free, so wild. I got to my dorm and locked the door to get a break from all of the madness I saw in just my short walk through the hallway. I decided to just take a nap to recharge. Classes were supposed to start in a few days, and I needed my rest so I could be fully focused. Not more than 20 minutes that I lay on the bed, I heard a knock on the door. I opened it, and there was Chris. He was also resuming that day, and he was assigned to be my roommate. I have to be honest, I wasn't pleased that Chris resumed the same day I did. I was expecting to have the room to myself that day, and maybe face the hassles of a new roommate the next day. But surprisingly, Chris wasn't like the other students I've seen in the hallway. He was cool, and we got along immediately. He was also from the suburbs of Minnesota, which kind of surprised me. He didn't look or show any sign of nervousness about the big change from small town to city. When I asked him why, he said he had a brother in the school and he used to visit him all the time during the past summers. He kind of got used to the dorms and the strangeness of the college. He promised that I was also going to get used to it. A few weeks later, I came back to the dorm room and I found Chris beaming with excitement. I asked him what was going on and he told me that his brother, who was a final year student, invited us to a beach house party. Chris was thrilled about this, but me on the other hand? Not really. The mid-semester tests were drawing near and all I wanted was to stay in the room and study all day. I told Chris to go on without me, but he wouldn't have it. After a few minutes of back and forth, he promised to help me study if I go with him. I shrugged and said okay. I didn't need his help to study, but I saw that he wasn't going to take no for an answer. So we went to the party. I wasn't a party guy, but after a few drinks, I loosened up and started to enjoy myself. I lost sight of Chris in the party, but after a few minutes, he found his way back to me. Then he took me to see his brother, Max. Max was the textbook bad boy. He was really cute, wore leather jackets, rode a motorcycle, and had a way with words that made the girls fall over themselves. I thought that as a final year student, all you do was study and work on your project till you graduate. But here Max was, partying as if his life depended on it. Chris said he was a top tier student. Only God knows how. Anyways, we were introduced, and Max gave us more drinks and introduced us to some really pretty third years. I did pretty well with the mid-semester tests, and when the exams drew close, I doubled up on my studying and passed it with flying colors. Max graduated that summer, and he threw another party, or let's just say a friend threw him a party. It wasn't on a beach house this time, it was an apartment, the one Max shared with his roommate and friend. We got there, and Max introduced us to Edward. Edward was also a final year, now graduating student. He was popular because he was one of the best players on the college's soccer team. He was also very good looking with his blonde hair, ocean blue eyes, and a huge towering frame. But that's all there was. He wasn't smart. Not just academically, he wasn't smart, period. We started a conversation and asked some questions about the football team because Chris was thinking of joining. All he talked about was his love for soccer and how he didn't see himself doing anything else. Um, that wasn't the question we asked. Chris and I exchanged a glance, and I spoke again, rephrasing the question. I asked him how we go about joining the soccer team. He paused for a few minutes, and it looked as though he had spaced out. Just when we were about to give up on getting anything from him, his eyes lit up and he said something like, Oh, you want to join the soccer team? Chris answered yes, and asked him how to go about it one more time. Edward spaced out again, then shrugged and walked away. I was so sure he was on some type of psychedelic drug and that he was higher than a floating bird. That was the only explanation that made sense. But after a few days of hanging out with him, we came to find out that he was as dumb as a lobotomized rock. The only thing he was particularly good at, apart from sports, was playing pranks on people. Sometimes I lay in bed trying to fathom how he graduated from college. Anyways, I was supposed to travel back to Minnesota to spend the long summer holiday with my family, but my mom and dad decided to take a vacation to Argentina. I didn't have a younger sibling. My older sisters had already graduated long ago, and after I left the house, my parents decided that it was time to enjoy their retirement. 
I couldn't go back to spend the holiday in an empty house. Chris invited me to spend the holiday with him and Max. They were staying in the beach house all summer, and all they were going to do was throw parties and hang out. If I had a choice, I would have taken a hard pass. As I've said before, I wasn't a party guy. How would I have been able to have coped with back-to-back -back parties all summer? I said yes, though, and moved with them to the beach house. The first few days were fun when it was just me, Chris, and Max. We met some girls next door, and I'd already taken a liking to one of them. The parties didn't start till Edward joined us in the beach house with what seemed like an endless supply of booze in his truck. The first party lasted for three days straight. On the third day, I was so sleep deprived that I picked up a mat and walked out of the house. I walked far away till I couldn't hear the blasting speakers anymore, and I slept at the shore. Anyways, because the party was going on every day, people started to get bored. Turns out that the idea of throwing a summer-long house party wasn't as good as an idea as it sounded. The turnout started to reduce after the first two weeks, and the numbers kept dropping. Eventually, one month in, no one was coming to the parties anymore. The remaining month was boring and uneventful, which was my happy place. We returned to school for our second year, and I quickly settled back into my studies. Chris decided that he was going to join the football team. After tryouts, he made the cut, and even though he might be warming the bench the entire semester, he didn't mind, as long as he was on the team. Fast forward to the second semester of the year, one of the starters that played Chris's position got injured, and Chris was allowed to start. This was the big break he had been looking for, and he was so nervous and excited. After a series of pep talks, I finally calmed his nerves. He played very well during the match, and our school won. It was a big victory for Chris and the school at large. This was because they'd been trying to beat the opponent team for quite some time now. Anyways, Max and Edward decided to do what they did best. They threw a party for the soccer team in the apartment they both shared, and everyone was invited. When Chris and I walked in, all eyes fell on him and they all started to cheer. Chris! 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 It was nice and he seemed to be enjoying all the attention. I blended into the background like always. I got a drink and walked out of the apartment and into the hallway to chill out. A few minutes later, I heard a wild laughter coming from the apartment. I wondered what the problem was, but I didn't go back in. The noise was too much for me. The door opened and Chris stormed out of the room and walked away, clutching to his joggers. I called out to him, but he didn't answer. He just walked down the stairs. Curious, I walked back into the apartment, and some people were still laughing. I walked up to one girl and asked her what the problem was. She told me that Edward had played a sick prank on Chris. He walked him to the center of the room and told Chris to tell the people how the match was won. Unknown to Chris, Edward wasn't asking because he cared about the details. All he wanted to do was distract him from the prank he was about to pull. When Chris became engrossed in the conversation with some girls, Edward snuck up behind him and put a bucket over his head. Chris raised his hand to pull off the bucket, allowing Edward the second needed to pull off his gray joggers. Now, I wasn't there, but I could tell how embarrassing that would have been for him because, unknown to anybody else but me, Chris had a kind of infection that caused blisters around the inner parts of his thigh. Because of this, he couldn't wear underwear until they were fully healed, because the friction from his boxers would only make the blisters worse. So there he was with his pants down, no underwear, dang. Anyways, I went back to the dorm to see how he was doing. He was playing a video game, so I joined him. We played in silence for a few minutes, then I told him I heard about the incident. He shrugged it off, but I knew he was still mad. There wasn't any way I could console him or anything. All I needed to do was cheer him up. So I turned to him and told him to get revenge. He waved me off saying it was fine and even if he wanted to get revenge, how would he have done it? I didn't know how at the time, so we just dropped it. But then a few days later, I went to Max and Edward's apartment to get some things for Chris. He didn't want to go himself because he was still mad at Edward. Anyways, Max and Edward were talking about their life after school. Max had secured an internship in another city, so he was moving away. Edward, on the other hand, could only think about going pro. He wasn't interested in boring jobs, like he said, and all he was waiting for was the letters from international soccer teams waiting to sign him. 
As soon as I heard that, I knew exactly how to get back at him. I hurried back to the dorm to look for Chris, but he wasn't there. Then I ran over to his faculty to see him. Chris was kind of surprised to see me, but when I explained the plan to him, he was as equally as excited as I was. The plan was simple. We were going to make Edward believe that an international soccer team was interested in signing him. That would have been impossible to pull off if we were doing this to a normal person with average intelligence. But Edward didn't fit any of the criteria. He wasn't normal, nor did he have at least average intelligence. It wasn't going to be a walk in the park. We rushed back to the dorm and created a fake email account. We cloned it to look like the email account of the coach of the Manchester City Football Club. We waited a few days till Max moved out and Edward couldn't ask him for help. Then we drafted an email inviting him to come over to Manchester, England to join the club. We called Max to give him a heads up so he wouldn't get involved. Then we sent the email and waited to see what he was going to do. The next day, I woke up with 11 missed calls from Max. Edward bought the email and was on his way to the airport. I laughed hard and woke Chris up to tell him the news. We started to contemplate calling him to let him know it was fake, but we eventually decided to let him go. He was going to figure it out eventually. Edward came back three days later and narrated how he went to Manchester, but the address where he was supposed to meet the coach turned out to be a Starbucks. He booked a hotel and for the next two days, he waited at the cafe, hoping to meet the coach. When that didn't happen, he went to Etihad Stadium, hoping to get in, but the security refused to allow him in. He even tried sending an email, but he didn't get a reply. He eventually decided that he was pranked, but he didn't know who did it, and we weren't going to tell him it was us. The major problem now was that he sold a lot of his stuff for cheap prices because he thought he wasn't coming back anytime soon. He also had to find a new apartment because his landlord had given his out already. Does anybody else agree that the stupid thing here is not that Edward actually bought the email and went out there without looking into it any further? It's that they were so confident that they were going to stay over there that they sold everything and uprooted their life and broke their lease on their apartment before ever confirming that they were actually joining the club? Either way, that's all the time we have for today. Now, if you want to hear another absolutely crazy story of revenge, check out that video on the left. Or if you missed my latest video, check out that video on the right. That said, I'll see you all next time with some more stories.